Welcome to Divine Bible Stories. As you close your eyes and prepare to drift into peaceful slumber, let us guide you through the timeless tales of the Bible. Join us on a journey of faith, wisdom, and tranquility. Each night, we'll delve into a different story, inviting you to immerse yourself in the ancient narratives that have inspired hearts for generations. Relax, let go, and allow the soothing words to lead you into a restful sleep. If you find solace and inspiration in our content, we kindly ask you to show your support by liking and subscribing to our channel. By doing so, you'll stay connected with us on this sacred journey. Thank you for choosing Divine Bible Stories as your companion for bedtime storytelling. May these stories guide you to peaceful dreams and a refreshed spirit. Now let the whispers of the past carry you into a serene slumber. Joseph's Journey from dreams to destiny. In the ancient land of Canaan, where the golden rays of the sun kissed the fertile fields, a tale of family and destiny was about to unfold. At the heart of this tale was Jacob, a man of legacy who had carried the weight of his father's dreams and blessings. His life was a patchwork of joys and sorrows, woven into the very fabric of the land he called home. Jacob had many sons, but the story began with one, Joseph. At the tender age of 17, Joseph already stood out among his brothers. He was not only his father's beloved son, but also the bearer of a coat of many colors, a testament to the love that Jacob held for him. This radiant coat marked Joseph as special, a beacon of his father's affection in a household filled with dreams and complexities. As the sun set over the sprawling fields, Joseph tended to the flocks alongside his brothers. Yet, there was an air of tension among them, for envy had taken root. Joseph, led by dreams that stirred his soul, had shared these visions with his brothers. Dreams of sheaves and stars bowing before him, visions that spoke of greatness and prominence. However, these dreams became a spark that ignited resentment and jealousy among his siblings. Bound by ties of blood, but divided by jealousy, Joseph's brothers could not bear the weight of his dreams. Each vision he shared seemed to magnify the gap between them. Even their father, Israel, known as Jacob, was not immune to the unease that these dreams stirred. The ornate robe Joseph wore was more than just a garment. It was a testament to a father's love and a son's dreams. It was a symbol of their unique connection woven from threads of affection and hope. However, with every thread of love that Jacob stitched into that coat, he unwittingly sowed seeds of discord among his sons. As the sun bathed the land in hues of gold, Joseph's dreams continued to unfold. His heart burned with visions of sheaves and stars, symbols of a destiny that seemed distant yet tangible. His brothers, however, saw not the promise of greatness, but the looming shadow of their own insecurities. Underneath the vast canopy of stars, Joseph's life took an unexpected turn. Sent by his father to check on his brothers, tending the flocks near Shechem, he embarked on a journey that would change his fate forever. As he wandered the fields, searching for his brothers, he encountered a man who offered directions to Dothan their new grazing site. Little did Joseph know that his destiny would be altered by the events that followed. In the distance, his brothers spotted him. Envy, like a tempest in their hearts, clouded their judgment. The vibrant coat he wore, a symbol of their father's love, now appeared as a stark reminder of their own perceived inadequacies. Plans were set in motion, and darkness descended upon Joseph's path, casting a shadow over his dreams. In the Valley of Dothan, fate took a cruel turn. His brother's envy culminated in a plot to end Joseph's life. Reuben, the eldest, sought to intervene, hoping to save his brother from their sinister plan. However, as Joseph approached, they stripped him of his coat, the coat that bore testimony to his father's love and his dreams of destiny. Amidst the bleakness, a twist of fate intervened. A caravan of Ishmaelites appeared on the horizon, offering an alternative to their malevolent scheme. Judah, driven by a different shade of morality, 
proposed that they sell Joseph as a slave to the Ishmaelites. And so, the brothers sealed their betrayal, exchanging Joseph's freedom for a handful of silver. As the Midianite merchants led Joseph away, his world was forever altered. He had been torn from the land of his dreams and thrust into an uncertain future. The caravan's footsteps faded into the distance, leaving behind a void that matched the one in Joseph's heart. In Egypt, a land of contrasts and mysteries, Joseph's destiny was about to unfold in ways he could never have imagined. From the pit of betrayal, he would rise to heights that would test his character and shape his identity. As his story continued to weave itself into the tapestry of time, the echoes of dreams and the whispers of destiny would guide him towards the ultimate purpose that awaited him. Tamar's Journey Deception and Redemption In the ancient land where Jacob had settled, a story unfolds that weaves the intricate threads of human emotions and destiny. This is the story of Tamar, a woman whose life became entwined with the family of Jacob, bringing forth both deceit and redemption. In this time of uncertainty, Judah, one of Jacob's sons, departs from his brothers to sojourn in the land of Adullam. Amid the shifting sands of life, he marries a Canaanite woman, and their union brings forth three sons, Er, Onan, and Shelah. Yet, Shadows of sorrow begin to cast their veil over their family. As the years pass, tragedy strikes. Er's wickedness invokes the wrath of the Lord, leading to his untimely death. Onan follows suit, deepening the well of sorrow within the family. This sequence of events sets the stage for a tale of darkness and complexity. Tamar, a central figure in this narrative, finds herself entangled in a web of circumstances. Left widowed, she stands at the crossroads of her destiny. Judah, haunted by the loss of his sons, sends Tamar away to live in her father's household, leaving her future shrouded in uncertainty. In a daring act, Tamar takes matters into her own hands. She disguises herself and positions herself on Judah's path. The encounter that follows changes the course of their lives forever. Unaware of her true identity, Judah propositions her, and Tamar, seizing the opportunity, secures a pledge of security from him. As the plot thickens, Judah's friend embarks on a mission to deliver a promised goat to the woman, only to find her vanished. Tamar's actions remain hidden as Judah searches for a woman who holds the key to his redemption. Time passes, and Tamar's pregnancy becomes evident. Accusations and judgments ensue, but Tamar emerges from the shadows armed with undeniable evidence, Judah's seal, cord, and staff. In a surprising twist, Judah, recognizing his own shortcomings, acknowledges Tamar's righteousness and chooses not to continue their relationship. Finally, Tamar gives birth to twin sons, Perez and Zera. From the depths of deception emerges a story of triumph over adversity, a story that exemplifies the intricate interplay of human emotions, choices, and the potential for renewal. Tamar's journey, marked by deceit and redemption, becomes a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and its ability to find a path toward healing and renewal, even within the most complex of circumstances. Joseph and the Prison Despite the trials that fate had woven for Joseph, his steadfast faith remained unshaken. As he found himself in the depths of an Egyptian prison, the shifting sands of his destiny once again took an unexpected turn. Even within the confines of his cell, Joseph's spirit remained unbroken, for he knew that the Lord was with him. The prison warden, observing the way Joseph carried himself, soon recognized the unique character that radiated from him. He saw the wisdom in Joseph's eyes and the quiet strength that emanated from his every action. In a world where despair often reigned, Joseph's presence stood as a beacon of hope. The warden, moved by the enigmatic aura that surrounded Joseph, entrusted him with a significant responsibility. Joseph became a figure of authority within the prison walls, overseeing the lives and tasks of those held captive. It was as if the very air within the prison had shifted, 
responding to the divine thread of purpose that Joseph wove through his every endeavor. With each passing day, Joseph's influence spread among the inmates, a testament to his unwavering belief that the Lord's guidance would prevail even in the darkest of times. His kindness and compassion became a source of solace to those around him, illuminating the gloomy corridors with a glimmer of humanity and hope. Through the midst of suffering, Joseph's journey had become a testament to resilience and faith, proving that even the harshest threads woven by circumstance could not extinguish the light of God's presence. Though imprisoned, Joseph's spirit soared, untouched by the bars that confined his body. And so, in the heart of that prison, surrounded by the shadows of captivity, Joseph's story continued to unfold. His faith and unwavering determination transformed the very nature of his confinement. In the intricate tapestry of his life, every thread, whether of hardship or triumph, was woven with purpose, guided by the hand of a divine plan that Joseph could not yet fully comprehend. As the seasons shifted and time marched forward, Joseph's life continued to intersect with the destiny that awaited him. The events yet to unfold would reveal the full breadth of his purpose, his unwavering faith, and the boundless providence of the Lord that guided his steps, whether in the land of dreams or the confines of a prison cell. Interpretations Unveiled A Glimpse of Destiny Within the cold walls of the prison, time flowed in a slow, somber rhythm. Joseph's presence continued to be a source of solace, his heart attuned to the stories and sorrows of his fellow inmates. It was amidst this desolation that the winds of destiny began to stir once again. The cupbearer and the baker, two esteemed officials of Pharaoh's court, found themselves confined alongside Joseph. Their countenances bore the weight of dejection, their spirits burdened by the shadows of their own predicaments. One morning, as the first light filtered through the small windows of the prison, Joseph approached them, his eyes kind and understanding. Why do you carry such heaviness in your hearts? Joseph inquired, his voice a balm for their troubled souls. The cupbearer, his eyes filled with a mixture of frustration and resignation, spoke, In the darkness of the night, both my comrade and I had dreams that haunt our minds. Yet, there seems to be no one here who can unveil their meanings. With a calm assurance, Joseph responded, Do not the interpretations of dreams belong to God? Share with me your visions, and perhaps I can shed light on the secrets they hold. The chief cupbearer, his eyes betraying a flicker of hope, recounted his dream. He described a vine adorned with three branches, blossoming and bearing fruit. In his hands, Pharaoh's cup received the luscious clusters of grapes. Joseph's eyes gleamed with insight. The branches symbolize three days, and within that time, Pharaoh will restore you to your former position as his cupbearer. You will once again place the cup into his hands. When that day comes, I ask that you remember me in kindness. Speak my name to Pharaoh, that I may be freed from the chains of this dungeon. The chief baker, seeing the favorable interpretation granted to the cupbearer, found courage to share his own dream. He spoke of three baskets of bread atop his head swarmed by birds that devoured the baked goods. Joseph's gaze remained steady as he delivered the weighty message. Again, the three baskets signify three days. However, your destiny is different. In three days' time, Pharaoh will lift your head from your body and set it upon a pole. The birds shall feast upon your flesh. True to Joseph's interpretation, the days unfolded their destinies. On Pharaoh's birthday, the air was thick with anticipation as he called forth the cupbearer and the baker. The cupbearer's position was reinstated, as Joseph had foretold, and he stood once again by Pharaoh's side. Yet the baker's fate was sealed, his life forfeit, just as Joseph's interpretation had revealed. The intricacies of dreams and their meanings wove a tapestry of fate within the prison's walls. While the cupbearer was restored to favor, Joseph's plea to be remembered seemed to fade like a whisper in the wind. The cupbearer, engulfed by his own responsibilities and comforts, forgot the promise he had made to Joseph. And so, 
Joseph, the interpreter of dreams, remained within the shadowed embrace of the prison walls, his own destiny yet to unfold, awaiting the moment when the shifting sands of time would once again set his path in motion. Divine Revelation from Dreams to Destiny Two years flowed like grains of sand through an hourglass since Joseph had interpreted the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker. Yet, the rhythmic pulse of time did not stall, and the currents of fate began to converge once more upon Joseph. Pharaoh, the sovereign ruler of Egypt, was disturbed by the riddles that his dreams had woven. In the quietude of night, the Nile River had delivered visions that danced before his eyes. Seven robust cows, lush and plump, had emerged from the river's embrace, grazing contentedly on the reeds. Yet their tranquility was eclipsed by the appearance of seven emaciated cows, gaunt and forlorn, which emerged from the same waters, devouring the former with a voracious appetite. And in a separate dream, seven sturdy ears of grain were devoured by seven parched, withered ears, brought to life by the east wind's harsh breath. As dawn pierced the sky, Pharaoh's brow furrowed with worry, and he summoned the sages and seers of Egypt. But their wisdom crumbled in the face of his enigmatic dreams. The walls of Pharaoh's palace seemed to echo with the frustration of his vexed mind. It was then that the cupbearer, reminded by a twinge of conscience, stepped forward. With reverence, he recounted the days of their shared captivity and the young Hebrew slave who possessed the gift of interpreting dreams. The tale fell upon Pharaoh's ears like a whisper of hope amidst a symphony of uncertainty. Summoned from the depths of his confinement, Joseph emerged from the shadows of the dungeon. His appearance was transformed, as if his journey from captivity to council had breathed new life into his countenance. His tunic was replaced with garments of distinction, and his face was framed by a beard newly trimmed. Pharaoh, seated on his throne, recounted the dreams that had plagued his sleep. Joseph's response echoed through the chamber. I am powerless, Pharaoh, but God alone holds the key to the answers you seek. Pharaoh proceeded to describe the dreams in detail, and Joseph's eyes shimmered with clarity. These dreams are one, and through them, God has revealed his divine plan, Joseph proclaimed. His voice resonated with conviction as he unveiled the meaning. The seven fat cows and the seven healthy ears of grain are a vision of seven years of abundance that Egypt will experience. They will be followed by seven years of famine, symbolized by the emaciated cows and withered grain. The land will be gripped by hunger and scarcity. In the tapestry of Joseph's words, Pharaoh recognized the thread of truth woven with divine insight. The years of plenty and the years of want were written in the fabric of destiny, and Joseph offered a solution to mitigate the impending crisis. Commissioners were to be appointed to gather a fifth of the harvest during the years of abundance, storing the grain for the years of famine that would follow. Pharaoh was captivated by Joseph's wisdom and spirit, the very essence of God's guidance. A decision was swiftly reached as Pharaoh declared, in you, Joseph, I find a discerning and wise spirit, one that is guided by the divine. You shall be second in command in Egypt, overseeing the land's preparations for the times to come. Pharaoh bestowed upon Joseph his signet ring, adorned him in robes of distinction, and anointed him as a ruler in the land. The title that Joseph had earned resonated with the chambers of Pharaoh's palace, Zaphonath Paneah, a name that encapsulated his newfound purpose. As Joseph navigated his newfound responsibilities, the prophesied years unfolded like chapters in a grand saga. Egypt flourished during the years of plenty, and Joseph, with divine insight, oversaw the collection and preservation of grain. He was no longer a prisoner, but a steward of fate, a guardian against the approaching tempest of famine. With the passage of time, Joseph's own narrative intertwined with that of Egypt's. Two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, were born to him, symbols of God's grace and providence amidst the trials he had endured. True to Joseph's interpretation, 
the years of famine swept across the lands, casting their bleak shadow. Yet Egypt stood resilient, for Joseph's preparations had shielded the nation from the clutches of desperation. The abundance that had once flourished was a distant memory, but the legacy of Joseph's wisdom and God's guidance shone brightly as a beacon of hope in a time of darkness. The world in the grip of famine's grasp turned its gaze to Egypt. From far and wide, people came seeking sustenance, and they found not only grain, but also a compassionate ruler who shared his bounty with all who asked. And so, the story of Joseph, a tale of dreams and destiny, unfolded against the backdrop of shifting seasons woven by the hands of God and the choices of men. Reunion and Redemption Unveiling the veil of the past time had stitched together the fabric of trials and revelations, binding the destiny of Joseph with that of his brothers. Amidst the barren landscape of famine, Jacob sensed a glimmer of hope, whispers of grain in the land of Egypt. He turned to his sons, imploring them to venture forth and procure the sustenance that would shield their family from the grip of starvation. Ten brothers embarked on the journey, their footsteps guided by the tales of Egypt's abundance. But Benjamin, the youngest, remained sheltered at home, a cherished treasure that Jacob could not bear to risk. The arduous road led them to the threshold of Joseph's dominion, yet the man they encountered bore no resemblance to the boy they had once known. Clad in robes of authority, the once forgotten son had risen to govern a nation. As they bowed before him, faces touching the earth in obeisance, they remained oblivious to the interconnected threads that destiny had spun, a web of sorrows and second chances. Joseph's eyes settled upon his brothers, recognizing them even as they failed to recognize him. A whirlwind of emotions swirled within him, memories of their betrayal, the well that had been his prison, and the dreams that had set this journey into motion. Yet, shrouding his identity, he spoke as a stranger, his words tinged with a harshness born of the past. From where do you hail? he inquired, and their reply, from the land of Canaan seeking sustenance, tugged at the strings of his heart. Though his disguise concealed his true self, Joseph's dreams had foretold this very moment. The shadows of betrayal and forgiveness merged as he accused them of espionage, of plotting against the land. He interrogated them, demanding the presence of their youngest brother, Benjamin, as a proof of their truthfulness. Upon their revelation of their familial bonds, Joseph's heart ached, for he yearned to embrace them. But his purpose was not yet fulfilled, and he incarcerated them for three days, an echo of the years he had spent imprisoned unjustly. Their anguish mirrored his own, a taste of the sorrow he had endured. On the third day, a plan unfolded. They were to leave one brother behind as they journeyed back to Canaan, while the rest returned laden with sustenance. The youngest, Benjamin, held the key to their release, and Joseph, unseen behind his facade, observed their deliberations. As they conversed in their own tongue, unaware that Joseph understood, their hearts poured forth. The anguish they felt over their long-lost brother, Joseph, and the guilt they bore mingled with the relief they sensed when they believed he was lost to them forever. Reuben's voice, heavy with remorse, echoed through the air as he lamented his own powerlessness to save Joseph. Joseph's heart ached, his eyes misted with tears, and he withdrew to weep in solitude. But he emerged with resolve, for he was still bound by his purpose. Simeon was chosen to remain, while the others were laden with grain and provisions, their silver mysteriously returned to their sacks. As they departed, their hearts fluttering with both relief and trepidation, they stopped for rest and discovered the returned silver. Trembling, they whispered, What has God done to us? For destiny's threads were now weaving a new chapter, a chapter of truth revealed and past wrongs redeemed. Their return to Jacob unfolded as a tale of revelation. They recounted their encounter with the stern ruler of Egypt, the accusations of espionage, and the demand to bring Benjamin to prove their honesty. 
Jacob's heart ached as he realized that the pain of the past still lingered, and he lamented, Everything is against me. Reuben, bearing the weight of his own guilt, vowed to his father, Let my own sons pay the price if I do not return with Benjamin. Yet Jacob, with his heart heavy and eyes filled with sorrow, remained reluctant to part with Benjamin. The specter of past loss loomed, and he dared not risk losing his last connection to his beloved Rachel. Destiny's fabric, stitched with threads of pain, betrayal, and redemption, remained shrouded as the brothers faced their father. The future held secrets yet to be unveiled, truths yet to be spoken, and a reconciliation waiting to blossom. A feast of fate. The famine's grip still clung to the land, unyielding in its severity. The grain they had procured in Egypt had vanished, devoured by the hunger that raged like a tempest. In desperation, Jacob implored his sons to return to Egypt once more, to obtain more sustenance. But the echoes of their previous encounter haunted them, and Judah voiced their collective unease. The ruler had demanded their youngest brother's presence as a condition for their audience, a condition they could not ignore. Benjamin was indispensable to their journey. Israel's eyes searched their faces, his heart heavy with worry. Why did you tell the man you had another brother? They recounted their encounter with the ruler, his probing questions that led to the revelation of Benjamin's existence. Powerless to foresee the ruler's demand, they had little choice but to reveal the truth. Judah stepped forth, his voice steady yet fervent. Send the boy with me. Let us go, that we may live and not die. I pledge my own life for his safety. If I do not bring him back, I will bear the blame. And Israel, his heart swaying between anguish and necessity, relented. If it must be so, then take gifts, double the silver and Benjamin. May God grant you mercy before the ruler. The second journey commenced with gifts of the land's finest offerings, balm, honey, spices, and more, a tribute that mirrored their hope for mercy. Benjamin, laden with his father's blessings and their collective destiny, accompanied them. Joseph's gaze fell upon Benjamin, a mixture of emotions swirling within him. To the steward of his house, he issued an invitation, a meal to be prepared, a feast that would bridge the gap between estrangement and reunion. As the brothers entered Joseph's house, fear clung to their hearts like a shadow. The memory of the returned silver, a token of their first encounter, danced before their eyes. Suspicion fueled their worry. Was this another ploy to ensnare them? Hesitation led them to the steward, seeking explanation for the returned silver, but his reassuring words quelled their fears. Their God had blessed them, he proclaimed, and Simeon was returned to them. Within Joseph's abode, a transformation unfolded, water to cleanse their weary feet, provisions for their animals, and the anticipation of a meal awaited them. The gifts they bore were readied, and as Joseph arrived, they bowed before him, their actions and gifts a testament to their humility and hope for favor. Amidst the gifts and silver, Benjamin stood, a living emblem of Joseph's past. Joseph's heart swelled at the sight, his eyes brimming with tears. The sight of his brother Benjamin, the son of his beloved Rachel, moved him deeply, for he saw in him the threads of family, love, and redemption. Controlled emotions led Joseph to action, a retreat to a private room where his tears could fall freely. But with composure regained, he emerged to engage with his brothers. The feast began, a table laden with abundance, a feast that mirrored the journey from betrayal to reconciliation. Benjamin's portion, a testament to Joseph's emotions, was greater than the others. The assembly ate and drank, the divisions between Egyptians and Hebrews marked, a reflection of the social boundaries of that time. The brothers, seated in their birth order, observed one another with astonishment, their eyes reflecting the tapestry of their shared history. The feast marked more than sustenance for their bodies. It nourished their souls with the promise of renewal and the hope of redemption. The past's pain had begun to unravel, 
replaced by the intricate threads of healing, forgiveness, and the prospect of a brighter future. The redemption of Joseph and his brothers. The moment of revelation was as poignant as the sun's first light breaking through the darkness. Joseph, unable to restrain his emotions any longer, commanded his attendants to leave his presence. Alone with his brothers, he unveiled his true identity with a cry that echoed through the chambers of his heart. Tears flowed from his eyes like rivers, and his weeping was so loud that it reached the ears of the Egyptians and even reached the ears of Pharaoh's household. The once formidable ruler, now a man overcome with emotion, stood before his brothers, the very ones who had cast him into the depths of despair. I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? His voice trembled with a mix of vulnerability and anticipation. But his brothers, shocked and trembling, could not find their voices in the face of this unexpected revelation. Come close to me, Joseph gently urged. As they approached, he spoke again. I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. Do not be distressed. Do not hold anger against yourselves for selling me here, for it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. With these words, a tide of understanding washed over his brothers. The betrayal they had harbored for years gave way to a new comprehension. Joseph unveiled the grand design crafted by divine hands, a design that had guided him from pit to palace. God sent me ahead of you to preserve a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance, Joseph declared. He explained how God had orchestrated his journey from slave to ruler, using him as an instrument to secure his family's survival during the years of famine. His eyes brimming with tears of gratitude, Joseph embraced his brother Benjamin, the fullness of their bond evident in their shared tears. And then he kissed each of his brothers, weeping over them, their shared history intertwined with pain and redemption. News of Joseph's brothers reached Pharaoh's palace, bringing delight to the ruler's heart. Pharaoh himself instructed Joseph's brothers to return to their land, laden with provisions, new clothing, and carts. The brothers were to bring their father Jacob to Egypt, where they would find respite from the famine. In the land of Canaan, the astonishing news reached Jacob's ears. Joseph is still alive, his sons proclaimed. But Jacob, burdened by years of grief, found it hard to believe. Yet, as they recounted the details of their encounter with Joseph and displayed the gifts he had sent, the spark of hope reignited within him. The spirit of Jacob, also known as Israel, was revived, and a flame of conviction lit up his heart. I am convinced my son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. And so, a family torn asunder by betrayal, jealousy, and pain found themselves on the brink of a journey of healing, reconciliation, and redemption. The threads of their story, once frayed and tangled, now began to craft a narrative of forgiveness and reunion, guided by a divine hand that had orchestrated every twist and turn. Jacob's arrival in Egypt and reunion with Joseph. So Jacob and his family set out from Beersheba, and on their journey, God spoke to Jacob in a vision during the night. God reassured him, saying, Jacob, Jacob. And Jacob responded, Here I am. God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Isaac. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again. Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. Jacob left Beersheba, and his sons carried him along with their families and possessions in the carts Pharaoh had provided. They journeyed to Egypt, bringing their livestock and the possessions they had acquired in Canaan. Jacob's sons and grandsons, his daughters and granddaughters, his entire family, accompanied him. The total number of Jacob's direct descendants who went to Egypt, not including his sons' wives, was 66. With the two sons Joseph had in Egypt, the members of Jacob's family, who journeyed to Egypt, totaled 70. Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to inquire about the route to Goshen. And when they arrived, Joseph prepared his chariot and went to Goshen to meet his father, Israel. 
As soon as Joseph saw his father, he embraced him and wept for a long time. Israel said to Joseph, Now I can die, since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. Then Joseph said to his brothers and his father's household, I will go and speak to Pharaoh. I will tell him, My brothers and my father's household, who were living in the land of Canaan, have come to me. These men are shepherds, they tend livestock, and they have brought their flocks and herds and all they own. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks about your occupation, you are to say, We, your servants, have raised livestock from our youth until now, both we and our fathers. This will allow you to settle in the region of Goshen, as shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. Jacob's family settles in Egypt. Joseph went to Pharaoh and informed him, My father and brothers, along with their flocks and herds and all their possessions, have come from the land of Canaan and are now in the region of Goshen. Joseph then presented five of his brothers before Pharaoh. Pharaoh inquired, What is your occupation? They responded, Your servants are shepherds, just as our fathers were. They explained that they had come to live temporarily in Egypt due to the severe famine in Canaan and the lack of pasture for their flocks. They asked Pharaoh to allow them to settle in Goshen. Pharaoh told Joseph, Your father and brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is open to you. Settle your family in the best part of the land. If you know of any among them with special abilities, put them in charge of my own livestock. Joseph then brought his father Jacob before Pharaoh. After Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked him about his age. Jacob replied, The years of my journey on earth are 130. My years have been few and difficult, and they do not compare to the years of my father's. Jacob then blessed Pharaoh and departed from his presence. Joseph settled his father and brothers in Egypt, providing them with property in the district of Ramses, as directed by Pharaoh. Joseph also supplied his family with food according to the size of their households. Chief's Actions During the Famine A severe famine affected both Egypt and Canaan. Joseph gathered all the money from Egypt and Canaan by selling grain, and he brought it to Pharaoh's palace. When the people's money was exhausted, they came to Joseph, pleading for food. They declared that they were on the brink of death due to the famine and had no money left. Joseph proposed, Give me your livestock, and I will provide you with food in exchange since your money is gone. So the people brought their livestock to Joseph, and he gave them food in return. After the first year, they returned, admitting that they had no money or livestock left except for their bodies and land. They proposed selling themselves and their land to Pharaoh in exchange for food and seed. Joseph agreed and bought all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. The people willingly sold their fields because of the severity of the famine, and the land became Pharaoh's property. Joseph then enforced a policy where the people had to surrender one-fifth of their crops to Pharaoh, keeping the rest for themselves. The people acknowledged that Joseph had saved their lives and willingly entered into servitude to Pharaoh. Joseph established a law that a fifth of the produce would belong to Pharaoh, except for the land of the priests, who received a regular allotment from Pharaoh and didn't sell their land. Israel's time in Egypt and Jacob's passing. The Israelites settled in the region of Goshen, acquiring property and multiplying in number. Jacob lived in Egypt for 17 years, reaching a total of 147 years of life. As Jacob's time to pass away drew near, he called his son Joseph and asked him to promise that he would not bury him in Egypt. Jacob wanted to be buried alongside his ancestors. Joseph agreed to his request, and Jacob worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Jacob blesses Joseph's sons. After some time, Joseph received news that his father was ill. He took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and went to visit Jacob. When Jacob was informed that Joseph had come to see him, he summoned his strength and sat up in bed. Jacob recounted to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. 
he promised to make me fruitful, increase my descendants, and grant the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession to them. Jacob continued, Your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, born to you in Egypt before my arrival, will be regarded as my own sons, just like Reuben and Simeon. Any children born to you later will be yours and will be identified by the names of their brothers. As I was returning from Paddan, your mother Rachel passed away in the land of Canaan. I buried her near Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. Upon seeing Joseph's sons, Jacob inquired, Who are these? Joseph replied, They are the sons God has granted me. Jacob requested, Bring them to me so I can bless them. Due to old age, Jacob's eyesight was failing, and he could barely see. Joseph brought his sons close to Jacob, who kissed and embraced them. Jacob exclaimed, I never imagined I would see your face again, let alone meet your children. Joseph then positioned his sons before Jacob. Jacob placed his right hand on Ephraim's head and his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the older of the two. He then blessed Joseph, saying, May the God before whom Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, the God who has shepherded me throughout my life, bless these boys. May they carry my name and the names of my ancestors, Abraham and Isaac. May they multiply greatly upon the earth. Observing that Jacob's right hand was on Ephraim's head, Joseph was displeased. He attempted to adjust Jacob's hands, placing the right hand on Manasseh's head, but Jacob insisted that his actions were intentional. Jacob foresaw the future and declared, I know, my son, I know. Manasseh will also become a great people, but Ephraim, the younger one, will be even greater. His descendants will become a multitude of nations. Jacob blessed them and expressed that this blessing would be invoked upon future generations. Furthermore, Jacob foretold, I am about to die, but God will be with you and lead you back to the land of your ancestors. I give you an additional portion of land that I seized from the Amorites with my sword and bow. Jacob's blessing and passing Jacob called his sons together and spoke to them about what would befall them in the days to come. He summoned them, saying, Come and listen, sons of Jacob. Listen to your father Israel. He began by addressing his firstborn, Reuben. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my strength, the first evidence of my manhood, excelling in rank and excelling in power. But you were unstable as water, so you will not excel anymore, for you climbed onto your father's bed, onto my couch, and defiled it. Then he turned to Simeon and Levi, who were brothers. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter into their counsel. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew men, and in their self-will they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. He proceeded to bless Judah. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. Zebulun was foretold to dwell by the seashore and become a haven for ships. Issachar was likened to a strong donkey lying between two burdens. Jacob foresaw Dan as a judge among his people, a serpent by the way a viper by the path who bites the horse's heels. Gad was prophesied to be attacked by a troop, but he would overcome them. Asher was described to have rich and delightful food. Naphtali was symbolized as a deer set free that bears beautiful fawns. Joseph was likened to a fruitful vine by a spring, his branches reaching over the wall. 
Jacob acknowledged the challenges Joseph faced and attributed his strength to God. Benjamin was compared to a ravenous wolf who devours prey in the morning and divides the plunder in the evening. These blessings were given by Jacob to his sons, representing the twelve tribes of Israel. After blessing them, Jacob gave them instructions. I am about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave, in the field of Ephron the Hittite, near Mamre in Canaan, the cave that Abraham bought from Ephron for a burial place. When Jacob had finished imparting his instructions, he drew his feet onto the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his ancestors. Joseph's Mourning and Legacy Joseph wept and kissed his father's lifeless body. He then instructed his physicians to embalm his father, a process that took 40 days. The Egyptians mourned Jacob's passing for 70 days. After the mourning period, Joseph approached Pharaoh's court and asked for permission to bury his father in the land of Canaan, as Jacob had requested. Pharaoh granted his request, allowing Joseph to go and bury his father. Accompanied by Pharaoh's officials, members of Joseph's household, his brothers, and a significant company, they journeyed to the threshing floor of Atad near the Jordan River. There, they mourned for seven days. The Canaanites named the place Abel Mizraim, signifying the solemn mourning of the Egyptians. Following Jacob's instructions, his sons carried his body to the cave in the field of Machpelah in the land of Canaan. This cave was the burial place Abraham had purchased from Ephron the Hittite. After the burial, Joseph and his brothers returned to Egypt. With their father's passing, Joseph's brothers feared he might seek vengeance for the wrongs they had committed against him. To address their concerns, they sent a message to Joseph, claiming that Jacob had requested forgiveness for them. Joseph wept upon receiving their message. His brothers then approached him, expressing their willingness to be his slaves. However, Joseph reassured them, saying that he would not take revenge. He acknowledged that while they intended harm, God had turned their actions into something good, saving many lives. He comforted and spoke kindly to them. Joseph continued to live in Egypt with his father's family. He lived for 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. Before his death, Joseph prophesied that God would bring the Israelites out of Egypt to the Promised Land, and he made them swear to carry his bones with them when they left. Joseph passed away at the age of 110. He was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt, awaiting the fulfillment of the promise to his people. As the stars twinkle above and the night embraces you, we gently conclude our journey through divine Bible stories. We hope these timeless tales have woven threads of serenity and reflection into the fabric of your dreams. If you found comfort and inspiration in our nightly stories, we invite you to continue this journey with us. Like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to stay connected and receive notifications about our upcoming stories. Remember, the wisdom of these stories is always within reach, waiting to guide you on your journey. Until we meet again in the realm of dreams, may peace and tranquility accompany you through the night. Thank you for choosing Divine Bible Stories. Sleep well, dream deep, and awaken with a heart filled with hope.